in Revelation, the 19th chapter, it describes Jesus' second coming. It describes him coming back on a white horse. And it says this about it. It says, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Now, it's not unusual for somebody to have their name written on their garment. Uh, you find that occasionally. But why would Christ have his name written on his thigh? That you don't see very often. But it says that he has his name written on his thigh. You remember Abraham. Abraham of old did not want his son, Isaac, marrying one of the Canaanite women. And so he called his old servant, Eliezer, and he said, I want you to go back to my home place, and I want you to find a wife for Isaac. And it says this about his relationship with Eliezer. Watch what it says here. So Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house, who ruled over all that he had, please put your hand under my thigh, and I will, ma and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. You see, that's the way they entered into a covenant or an oath. They placed their hand under the person's thigh, and they entered into that covenant with it. So that's the reason Christ's name is written on his thigh, because it represents his covenant when he comes back, a covenant that he has with his people. You see, the Lord is looking for people that will be his people. That's what he's looking for. He's looking for those that he can say, these are my people. Listen to what he says about them. He says this, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for what? For himself. What are they going to be? A special treasure above all the people who are on the face of the earth. He said, I'm looking for some people that will be my people. They will be a special treasure to me above all the people that are on the face of the earth. Now, there are people that say, well, that was referring to the Jewish people. And that's what he was talking about as the Jewish people. No, it's really not, because that same promise, folks, is repeated in the New Testament. Listen. And you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. How do we know it's not talking about the Jewish people here? Listen, you who once were not a people but are now the people of God who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. So he's saying clearly that this was for referring to the Gentile. So God is looking for some people that he can enter into a covenant with. That's what he wants to be, enter into a covenant. And he can say, these are my people. And those people that he enters into a covenant with, he says, these are a special treasure to me. Listen, he gives this promise. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all the people for all the earth is mine. So he said, if you'll just enter into this covenant with me, and if you'll obey my voice, keep my commandments, you will be a special treasure. Now that ought to mean something to you when God says, you'll be a special treasure to me. Let me ask you something. If you're a special treasure to God, then is he going to take care of you? Huh? Absolutely. You can depend on that. He will take care of you. He promises that. He promises this. But this is what I commanded them, saying, the, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people, 
and walk in all the ways I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. He said, if you'll just do this, it'll be well with you. Things will go like they should. This is what God wants to do for you and for me if we're just willing to enter into this covenant. So what is the covenant? What is the covenant that God wants to make with you and with me? Let's see what it is. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's the covenant. God says, okay, the covenant I want to make with you is you are to be my people and I will be your God. And he, he mentions this over and over in the Scripture. Then I will give them one heart and I'll put a new spirit within them and take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statues and keep my judgments and do them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. That's the covenant, folks. He's saying, you be my people. I will be your God. And if you are my people, then you will be a special treasure to me. And it will be well with you. That's something that you and I can depend on. That's something that we know God will do. In the New Testament, it carries the same theme right on through here in 2 Corinthians. It says, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So that's the covenant. If you're looking for the covenant, the covenant you're making with it, and you're saying, you be my God. I will be your people. So the question I have this evening is, are you willing to do that? Are you willing just to say, you be my God. I will obey your voice. I'll walk in your commandments. And God says, if you will do that, I will be your God, and I will take special care of you. That he promises to you and to me. When God makes a covenant, he sometimes makes an everlasting covenant. That means never ends. It's good for eternity. Everlasting covenant. He made an everlasting covenant with Abraham of old. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generation for an everlasting covenant to what? To be God to you and your descendants after you and confirmed it to Jacob for a statue to Israel as an everlasting covenant. So he said, I'm going to make a covenant with you. I will be your God. You shall be my people. This will be an everlasting covenant that I will make with you. He takes that and promise, brings it right on down as it refers to you and me. He says, if you are of Christ, then you're what? So he said, this covenant that I made over here with Abraham of old, this everlasting covenant I made with him, if you accept Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So the promises he made to Abraham when he said, I'll be your God, you be my people, I'll bless you, those promises are yours. Because he said, he gave you, if you be of Christ, then you're Abraham's seed. Ephesians, he goes on and says, Therefore remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh, that at that time you were without Christ. When they were, we were Gentiles in the flesh, that meant before we accepted Christ, we were without him. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the what? Covenant of the promise. He said, when you were without Christ, 
You were strangers. You were alien. You, you weren't part of the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been what? Brought near by the blood of Christ. So he said, this promise I made, this covenant I made applies to you as well. He continues here and says, just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of now, did you understand what he's saying there? Sons of Abraham. In other words, he's saying, just because you may have been born a Jew, that doesn't make you a child of Abraham. Only those that are a child by faith. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. In other words, I accept Christ. When you accept Christ, you become part of Abraham's seed, and by faith, you receive the promise that he made to Abraham of old. Therefore, it is of faith that we might be according to the grace that is so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of what? Faith of Abraham, who is the father of all. So this evening, what you and I must decide is, am I willing to reach out in faith and say, you be my God? I'll walk with you. I'll obey your voice. I'll keep your commandments. If you will be my God, and God says, if you will do that, then you will be my people. And it will be well with you. Okay. Therefore, the children of Israel, now watch what happens here. He's saying, you're my people. I'll care for you. And then he turns right around and he gives you something to substantiate that, to make sure you understand. And it says, therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generation as a perpetual covenant. He said, now I'm going to make a covenant with you here. And I'll be your God. You shall be my people. And he said, I'm going to give you the Sabbath as a perpetual covenant that you are to keep the Sabbath as evidence that you are my people. Watch. It says this over and over. It is a... What? It is a sign between me and the children of Israel for how long? Forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth... And on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So he said, it's a sign between me and you. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statues. Keep my judgments. Do them. Hallow my Sabbaths. And they will be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. See, he's saying, listen, I'm, I'm giving you the Sabbath. And the Sabbath is to be a sign that you are my people. And he said, walk with me. Obey my voice. Follow me. And I, in turn, will bless you. And the Sabbath is a sign that I have given you. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbath to be a what? A sign. Here it is again between them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. He said, this is a sign that I'm making between you and me. This is a covenant that he's made with us. Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep, okay? For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generation, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. So this is the covenant that God wants to make, and he gave us the Sabbath as a sign 
of that covenant. And he said, this is a perpetual covenant that will go on forever. Now, the question that we need to ask ourselves this evening is, was this covenant that God made, was the Gentiles included in that covenant? Or was that just a covenant he made with the Jewish people? Was the Gentile included in that covenant that he made? Well, the children of Israel are standing on the banks of the Jordan River. They're about to go across the Jordan into the land of Canaan. And Moses is speaking to them here. And I want you to listen to what he says to them. I make this covenant and this oath not with you alone, but with him who stands here with us today before the Lord our God, as well as with him who is not here with us today. Well, uh, who else was there? He said, I'm making this covenant not with just you alone, but also with those that stand with us here today. Who else was there? Well, there was quite a few Egyptians that had come. And he said, not just with that, but with those that aren't even here. So that covenant included more than just the Jewish people. Listen to this one. Also the sons of the who? Foreigner. That's definitely not the Jewish people. The sons of the foreigner who join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath, okay, and holds fast my covenant. There it is. You see, he said, I'm making a sign. I'm making a covenant with you, and the Sabbath I'm giving you is to be a sign. All right, let's watch as it goes on. Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifice will be accepted on my altar. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. So, yes, it included much more than just the Jewish people. It included the Gentiles as well. So when God says, follow me, walk with me, keep my commandments, dear friend, that included the Gentile. That was a promise he gave, and he said, I want you to be my people, and I'll be your God. Well, when you pick up your Bible and you begin to study it and go through it, it, it talks about a new covenant. A new covenant. Uh, why did we need a new covenant? It says here, for if the first covenant had been faultless, no place would have been sought for a second. So, so there was something wrong, something wrong with the first covenant. Uh, was there something wrong with the uh, conditions of the covenant? Was there something wrong with what was written down? Uh, what was wrong with the first covenant? Because it said if, if there wasn't anything wrong with it, well, then we didn't need a second one. So there was something wrong with it. Well, let's see if we can find out where the problem is, what was wrong with it. This is Moses. is that he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. Was that a good response or a bad response? Oh, that's a good response. Wasn't anything wrong with that response. So they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. Where was the problem? Well, the problem was here, folks. Because finding fault with them. The problem wasn't with what was written down. The problem wasn't with what the conditions of the covenant were. The problem was with the people. They said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient, but they weren't obedient. Behold, the day are com days coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So it says that they didn't follow the Lord. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants because they have transgressed the laws changed the ordinances, and broken the everlasting covenant. They didn't follow. They didn't obey the Lord's voice. And so, 
because they didn't keep the covenant, then there was need for a second covenant. Now, we need to take a close look at this second covenant and see what it says about it. A new covenant. You understand, that's what this book's about. You see, that word covenant there. Old covenant, new covenant. That's what the Bible is. Old Testament, New Testament. That's what's involved there. What is the new covenant? What's, what's involved in the new covenant? I, I just want to say to you this evening, folks, if you understand the new covenant and you understand what Christ has done, it, it changes things and makes everything different. So I hope you'll follow very carefully as we look at it. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. Every time you participate in the Lord's Supper, the communion service, you are entering into a covenant with God. Amen. That's what that's about. You're entering into that, and you're saying to him, you be my God. I will be your people. That's a covenant you're entering into with him. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, referring to Jesus Christ, inasmuch as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Well, now, it says that Christ is the mediator of a better covenant, which is established on better promises. Well, let me ask you something. Is your promises better than the Jewish people? You got more willpower? You got more backbone? Your promises better than theirs? If they're not, then how does this work? Established on better promises. When can a covenant be changed? Let's take a look at that. When, let's say that you and I tonight, we're going to enter into a covenant. Uh, we're going to draw up, we could call it a contract, we could draw agreement, uh, whatever word we want to use for it, we're going to enter into a contract. And let's say that you and I, uh, we agree on certain points, and we go to an attorney, and we ask him to draw up a covenant for us. We go to the attorney, he draws up the covenant. Uh, puts down all the conditions that you and I want to have in the covenant. Okay? Puts it all down there, draws it up into legal terms. And we read it over and we say, that's, that's good. And so we take it to a notary and we have it notarized. Okay? Can that covenant, that contract, that agreement, whatever you want to call it, can it be changed? You've got to be real clear on that. Can it be changed? Well, let's see what the Scripture says. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. In other words, uh, sure it can be changed. You and I can say, well, this particular part in here we don't like, and we can go to, an attor to the attorney, and we can have that stricken out. Initial it and say, we want this changed. It can be changed. But if one of us dies, can it be changed? No. In other words, when one of us dies, that covenant is in force, cannot be changed. Get it clear. And don't let anybody ever tell you any different. Okay? Because I hear people say, that after Jesus died, he changed the covenant. No, could not. When he died, he sealed the covenant. Cannot be changed. He sealed it with his blood. And therefore, that covenant could not be changed. Okay? So, a covenant is changed before people die. When Christ died, he sealed the covenant. That time on. All right. And for the reasons... 
And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death. He's the mediator of a new covenant by means of death. In other words, in order for the covenant to be in force, he had to die. It required that. That's the reason he's the mediator of a better covenant, because he died for you and for me. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. So Jesus came. He died. By his death, he put into effect that covenant. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. So it's been enforced. And so we read here, but God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ what? Died, died for us. Came, died on the cross, paid the price for you and for me. That he did. Without that, folks, we're lost. Without that, no hope. But Christ said, listen, I want to enter into a covenant with you. I will pay the price. I'll die for you. Now, if that's all that was necessary, that might be all right. But the covenant required much, much more than that. You see, it doesn't just require the death. It requires a perfect life. You see, law, and that's what he says, if you'll obey my commandments, law is involved. The law says if you break it, you must what? You must pay the penalty. So if I break the law, then I must pay the penalty. That, that's true with everything. If I go out here and I run a stop sign, then the cop gives me a ticket, I'm going to have to pay the fine. I have to pay the penalty. The penalty for breaking God's law is what? Is death. I cannot. I cannot pay that penalty and have life. I can pay the penalty, if you please, and die and be lost, but I can't pay the penalty and have life. Therefore, Jesus said, I will die in your place. And he paid the penalty for you and for me. So when I accept Jesus Christ, his death pays my penalty. And all my sins are forgiven. And I stand right in the eyes of God. The law is satisfied. Okay? But the law, the law now says, okay, your debt's paid. You're under no condemnation. You just have to be perfect. That's what the law says. The law will accept nothing less, folks. It will accept nothing less than perfection. You tell me one law that will. Just tell me a law that will accept something more than, uh, less than perfection. If I run out here and I get in the car and I go down here and I run the stop sign and the policeman pulls me over and says, Mr. Cox, didn't you see that stop sign? And I say, yes, sir. I say, well, why didn't you stop? And I say, oh, officer, I'm holding some meetings here, and I go back and forth here all the time, and, and I only run this stop sign 1% of the time. What's he going to do? He's going to give me a ticket. He's going to tell me you stop every time. Law demands 100%. The problem is, is I'm not perfect. That's the problem. So Jesus said, 
I'll not only die for you, I'll live a perfect life for you. This is what it says. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, Jesus Christ died that we might be reconciled to God. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. He said, yes, I'll come and I'll die in your place. But not only will I die in your place, I'll live a perfect life for you. Now, if you don't get anything else out of this presentation, folks, I hope you get this. Because as far as I'm concerned, it's the most important part of it all. And it says here, Now may the God of peace, who brought up the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Now watch carefully what he's going to do. Make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Now, it says here that he, through the blood of the everlasting co covenant, will do what? Will make you complete. You see, dear friend, that's the work of the Lord. And you and I must learn to do this. You see, God's desire is that you say to him, you be my God, I'll follow you. I will surrender my life. I will surrender my soul to the work of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit works within us to make us complete. This is not your work. This is not my work. This is his work, my job is to surrender. And if I surrender, he will do his work in my life. Jesus said, then, then he said, Behold, I have come to do what? Your will, O God. He takes away the first, that's referring to the covenant, the first covenant, that he may establish the second establishes it because you and I can accept that and since it is Christ who died it's Christ who lived a perfect life he never sinned once not even so much as in thought he lived an absolute perfect life and since he died and he lived a perfect life that new covenant is established on better promises his promises that he made that you and I can receive eternal life in Jesus Christ salvation is totally and completely of God what do I mean by that you cannot add one thing to it there's nothing you can do dear friend nothing that you can do to add to the plan of salvation. The only thing that you and I can do is accept what Christ has done. And he died, and he lived a perfect life for you and for me. Therefore, he did everything that was necessary, everything that was required for you and I to have salvation then what is my responsibility? Well, my responsibility is simply to obey. If you will obey my voice, keep my commandments, then you shall be my people, and I will be your God. That's my responsibility. That's what God asked you and asked me to do is to be obedient. And if we're obedient, then he says, I'll bless you in a special way. The wisest man that ever lived summed it up very wonderfully. And he said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the 
whole duty of man. That you and I must simply walk with him, follow him in all that we do. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me that, I, that they might know that I am the Lord who what? Sanctifies you. See, this is talking about a very special relationship. He says, I gave him my Sabbaths that it's a sign that I can sanctify them. You know what that means? That means that he will work in our lives to change our lives to make us like him so that we do not sin, that we don't continue on sinning, that that is to stop in our lives. And he works in us in a very, very special way in our lives. This is what he does. And he says the Sabbath is a sign of that. It's a sign that I am your God and you are my people. It's what it represents. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. This is the covenant I'm going to make. I will put my laws in their mind. I will write them on their heart. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Now, you need to read that text carefully because he says he will do what? He says, I will put my laws in their mind. I will write them on their hearts. You see, that is our relationship to him, that we are to open up our lives. We're to open up our hearts and invite him in and let him do his work in our lives. I cannot, I cannot just go my own way. I have to surrender and let him work in my life as he wants to work in my life. That's what's to happen in my life. Jesus Jesus had a very, very special relationship with his Father. In fact, he came to this earth to show you and I how we are to live. And he, he was to show us how we're to live and how we're to relate to him by the way he related to his Father. That's what he was to show us. And it says here, and he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will, said Abba, Father. That word Abba, folks, is, comes directly from the Hebrew. We don't have a word in Engli English for it. The closest word we have for Abba is Daddy. It talks about a very, very close relationship with the Lord. That's what it talks about. So when Jesus is there praying, and he said, Abba, Father, that talks about a close relationship with the Lord Jesus, with his Father. A very intimate relationship. He wants to have that same relationship with you and with me. Right in the heart of his law, he gives us that relationship. It works like this. Right in the middle of the Sabbath, you have Abba. Abba, Father the relationship God has with us.